Hi, I'm James Kotecki here in the C-Space Influencer Studio here at CES 2019. Joining me is Jonathan Nelson, CEO of Omnicom Digital. Thank you so much for, Thanks for having me, James. being here and coming on to the studio for the third time. You are the first and only three-time guest here at the C-Space Influencer <laughs> Studio. I wish I had a smoking jacket or something for you or some kind of a prize. I get a gold watch you at the end of this. You definitely get a gold watch at the yes. end of this. Good, thank um, you. So we've talked several times, obviously, but yes. for those who don't know, how do you define Omnicom Digital for those who are meeting you for the first time? Well, so Omnicom is one of the major holding companies. Um, we own a number of advertising agencies, uh, TBWA, BBDO, DDB Needham. We also do large media buying, a lot of what we'd call below the line, so shopper marketing, PR. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a large advertising conglomerate, and I uh, oversee the digital side of all that. So digital cuts across all of these different disciplines that, that Omnicom does, and I'm trying to uh, push, it, push it forward, all the different components. So let's talk about something really exciting that's being pushed forward, uh -huh. artificial intelligence, machine right. learning. These are topics we've actually touched on in previous conversations. Yes. I'm curious, your snapshot on where things are now and what you're excited for ahead. Well, machine learning, I mean, it's sort of an ingredient of things. It's, it's rarely you go, wow, that's machine learning. I mean, everything underneath this, all the cloud computing systems in particular, but think self-driving cars, mm -hmm. uh, all of these systems are getting smarter and machine learning, artificial intelligence, which are basically the same idea, yeah. are pushing all of this forward. So in advertising, which is what we do, we're constantly looking at, at optimizing. So how do we put the right message in front of the right person at the right time? Quite frankly, for the right price. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got machines looking at it and building algorithms uh, to help us optimize exactly that. Are the next few years, you think, kind of an evolutionary path to just getting better and better at more precisely doing this kind of targeting? Or do you foresee any kind of, uh, kind of Cambrian explosions or like seismic shifts in the way that this actually works? Well, the way that technology works is it's sort of incremental until somebody comes up with a yeah. huge breakthrough. And then, yeah, you see a, a step change in the function, and then it evolves from there. Uh, so it's hard to really see the step change in advance. Sure. So you sort of look for these incremental improvements, uh, mm -hmm. which we've been making year in and year out for decades now. And, uh, and then occasionally somebody will invent something like, hey, here's cloud computing, which is finally right. really taking root. So suddenly we have infinite amounts of storage and processing at, uh, very, relatively small price points, so we can do stuff that we just we couldn't have done five years ago. Um, could we have seen that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I knew cloud computing was coming, but you know, the fact that it's here, okay, let's take mm -hmm. advantage of that. But and you can look, you can always look back five years and say, yeah, I knew about that five years ago. Yeah. But you also knew about a lot of other things that were kind of in the ether, and which one would necessarily break through or be combined with other things in new ways is unknown. Yeah, a big part of my role is trying to figure out, okay, what which of these things is going to stick and really drive our bottom line and my client's bottom line, and which of these are sort of fads and may or may not take root, so. So is that an experimental process for you of trying to just collect data at small levels and then figuring out what you want to push to clients? Well, I, a lot of what I do is try to look across the landscape and figure out, okay, which technologies or companies or entrepreneurs or which ideas are we really going to get behind? Because they're, I mean, think about, it. CES is 275,000 square feet of exhibition space. There's like 4,500 different exhibitors. Obviously, not all of them are appropriate for advertising, but many of them are. But we can't do deals with all of them. So we have to pick our partners, we have to pick our technologies, and we have to figure out where we're trying to go. Mm -hmm. And you know, I work with a, a really great large team to help me do it, but figuring that out is a big part of our role. Where do we deploy our resources? And where do we drive results for our clients? Most of all, that's what's really get, we're getting at here. Uh, when you look at some of the client results you're able to achieve, are you personally ever kind of surprised anymore? Do you still get that wow factor of like, wow, I can't believe we're actually that good? I guess that was kind of a softball question. I wish I but, had <laughs> more. Um, yeah, you know, the, there's often really interesting, innovative uses of technology. I mean, I'm kind of a geek underneath all of this. And so some things that get me excited are probably pretty boring, or most people would be like, whatever. Not you know? to the audience of the C-Space Influencer Studio. Well, I think you're among yeah, your fellow I mean, I'm, I'm pretty here. excited about the things like purchase funnels and trying to figure out you know, signals inside the funnel and how people, like what are the transition states for people mm -hmm. as they move from, from awareness to consideration mm -hmm. to purchase to post-purchase, and what actually really moves people. And quite frankly, I, I want to make advertising more interesting, more engaging, I think, 
uh, stuff that is relevant to people obviously is going to be of more interest. But then how do we how do we tell the narrative? How do we do the craft better so that we are both more effective and, quite frankly, not wasting everybody's time? I know it's sometimes difficult to give uh, client examples because you don't want to just choose one of your children, you know, as the favorite one. But can you give an example of that funnel and kind of how things are moving through the consideration phase and maybe any kind of counterintuitive elements to that? Like, oh, I didn't realize that X indicated Y. Uh, gosh, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, whether it's selling new coffee products for McDonald's or cars for Nissan mm -hmm. or uh, selling new types of phone service for AT&T, we're constantly kind of experimenting and measuring and trying to look at the combination of, okay, what is working? Because that's the nice thing about digital is yeah. it's real time, right? You, can, you, can, you get a signal. You know whether it worked or not pretty much in real time. The question is how fast can you listen? And then moving people through that purchase funnel. So, and then creating a feedback loop. So it's like, okay, how many people did sign up for the family plan or how many yeah. Nissan Altimas did we sell or you know, did the McCafe work? We, we can figure that kind of stuff out, and we have all kinds of interesting, innovative programs to do that, and the back ends yep. to, to validate it. Um, you said in a previous conversation that you were in the precision persuasion business, which yes. I love that, very pithily kind of encapsulates what you do. Yeah. But it occurs to me that regulators and consumers today are expressing increasing concern of, is it too precise, and is it too persuasive, and how do you deal with that kind of potential pushback? Well, I think that people are right to examine this and people are right to question their privacy and we are very, very conscious of it both as individuals, as, as people, but also right. as advertisers. So we try to figure out, and by the way, it's a moving line constantly. I mean, we've seen the, with all the drama with Facebook and numerous other companies around privacy, the line moves, but our feeling as an educated consumer is a, is, is a good consumer. Uh, we try to figure that, that line out and back it up a little bit and say, mm -hmm. okay. On the other hand, I want to see stuff that I care about. I mean, there is a whole range of products that I don't care about. I don't think that I should have my time wasted by mm -hmm. those advertisers. And there are a whole host of products that I either buy regularly and will rebuy or want to know about. And so I think that the systems, quite frankly, should be smarter, that the messages should be more engaging and that they should be managing me through the process. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's that's free game as far as I'm concerned and a good use of my time. We talked, I think, a couple years ago about the idea of a pendulum between a focus in your industry on data and technology and on yes. creativity. Yeah. And I think you said at the time that maybe the pendulum had swung a little bit more toward data, but that you yeah. thought it might swing back. Is that Has it swung back? And do you even still think in terms of a pendulum? Is that still the right metaphor? Oh, use? I absolutely think. I mean, the pendulum thing is real, and I guess the, my dream of the advertising industry is that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, mm -hmm. meaning, look, we can do data and precise targeting and do the left brain things that we've been all talking about kind of quite frequently for the past decade or so, but also do the craft, right? The creativity, and I think that the, the issue that I've got is everybody's been trying to assimilate the left brain data side so much that that has been too much of the conversation. I'd rather see it kind of moderate so it's like the right message to the targeted right person, right time. Right. So um, you have been coming to CES since 1984, I believe, is that yes, right? Yes, I uh, am <laughs> um, showing my scales uh, as a dinosaur. Uh, so in all that time, obviously, a lot has changed. What hasn't changed? Well, I'm, I've always been really interested in just watching the innovation. And when I first started coming, the consumer electronic show, I w I'm a big stereo uh, audio guy. And I would come because all the latest loudspeaker designers, amplifier designers, they would come. And at that point, CS was in Chicago. Uh, and you could go and you could listen to these, this equipment that you, you know, mortal humans kind of couldn't really yeah. touch unless you were in a different tax bracket than I was when I was a teenager. Um, that spirit of innovation is still absolutely present, if not even more so as CES proliferates. I mean, it's got more pavilions, it's larger, it takes over Las Vegas. I believe it's the largest trade show in the world. 180,000 people are attending this thing. Um, so it, it really is that, that core of innovation and people showing the new stuff that is, remains excited from 1984 to today. Uh, at CES, we, and in, in these interviews, we love to make uh, bold predictions and statements. Is there some kind of, uh, whether it's CES or elsewhere, is there a favorite kind of bad prediction of technology that sticks with you? 
Oh, gosh, there are so many. I mean, when was it? A couple of years ago, 3D television. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, would you put on a headset to really watch TV? You know, and I, you know, I, I was never buying that one. I mean, each year leading into CES, everybody wants to go, okay, what's your prediction? What's the revolutionary thing that everybody's yeah. going to be talking about? And, you know, maybe, what, 50% of those things are talked about yeah. three years later. Um, you know, what is it? What is it this year? I, you know, I'm not sure. There, are, uh, to the positive, there's some really, really amazing things out. You know, on in these pavilions all around us. So, what's the what's one thing that you've seen or that you're excited about? So, the coolest thing that I have seen so far is a ultrasound wand mm -hmm. that plugs into your phone. Mm -hmm. So this is a piece of machinery that you can use to literally see your internal organs or look at a, a, a baby in the womb. 1700 bucks plugs into your phone. Mm -hmm. Now, I realize for most people, they're not gonna pay 1700 bucks for an ultrasound thing that plugs into their phone, but the uses of this in third world countries are massive. Yeah. And I think that's a great example of technology and innovation making uh, what was high-end medicine accessible to more and more people and overall doing really great things. Uh, as we close out, what's something that you would like to ask one of your industry peers, maybe a competitor or anyone in your industry? Oh, gosh. Uh, I mean, I talk to my peers all the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's a thing about this where I think we're kind of all in this together. We're trying to forge, you know, we're trying right. to build the future. And so where is this going is <laughs> sort of the same question that has been asked for for, for my career, which is 25 plus years now, it's the same thing. Okay, what's next, what's next, what's next? Where does that go, where does this go? What do you think about this? It's a very, very complex and nuanced discussion. Uh, you know, there are no crystal balls here, but knowledge can be somewhat asymmetrical. So I'm yeah. constantly trying to pick people that are way smarter than me and figure out what they know and then try to assimilate it so we can do use it for our clients and our company. Well, it's funny you mention that because that is our exact model here in the C-Space Influencer Studio. Yeah. We get smart people I and, think I stole and, from you guys. and ask them what they know. So yeah. we really appreciate you being here, Jonathan Nelson, Thanks so much. Omnicom Digital. Thanks so much for joining us. And thank you so much for watching. I'm James Kotecki here in the C-Space Influencer Studio at CES 2019. Keep it right here. More great conversations are just ahead.